Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I'm Christy. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sealight Technologies. We are a local Medford-based startup that works on creating digital tools and solutions for eye and brain health. And so I just want to take a moment to welcome you all here today. And I'd love to do an introduction of each of our panelists and really understand, you know, what they do on their day-to-day -day basis that brings them into the world of AI. So why don't we go through each one of the panelists, starting with Tarun, and yeah, get excited. Hey, my name is Tarun. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Partner. We are trying to build a marketplace for last and middle mile logistics, focusing on big and bulky. Prior to partner, I worked as a consultant for five years in data science field with 14 final companies. And I'm really excited to be here and share my insight on AI and data science and machine learning. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Zara. I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders at Overwatch Data. Uh, we look at news, dark web, natural disasters, social media data, and we surface the companies what's relevant to them and give them enough context so they can do something with it. Uh, so we use machine learning for every step of that process. So we do a lot of, a lot of data. Um, previously, I was at Google's threat analysis group where we track state sponsor and hacking and disinformation. And so a lot of building software and systems to understand text and uh, actors at scale. Hi, everybody. My name is Susanna Matevosian. Uh, I'm currently a solution architecture lead at MongoDB. Uh, and I work with customers to understand and um, figure out a lot of the different use cases related to data. Prior to that, I was uh, working with Ativio on semantic search, IBM um, on chatbots, semantic search, that kind of stuff. So been playing with big data for some time now, um, mostly in the customer facing role. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Victoria. So I was head of analytics at a cannabis e-commerce company. Um, if anybody's heard of Lantern, we were all over the trash cans of Boston at one point. Um, I built out the data infrastructure there from scratch um, as the only data person on the team. Uh, started out as one person, eventually grew a team comprised of data engineering, data analytics, and data science. Um, as you guys might have known, if you're in the cannabis e-commerce space, Lantern was acquired uh, January this year. So it was a bit of a celebration there. Um, and uh, sort of on the side, now I'm looking for my next project. So definitely interested in talking to anyone about building data infrastructure and uh, you know talking about modeling data in the face of uncertainty. So. Awesome. And so just to get an idea of who we have here in the audience or even who we have here virtually as well, by a show of hands, I'd love to understand how each of you are interacting with data. So how many people in the house or on the chat or are data scientists? Awesome. How about data engineers? <laughs> data analysts? Non-technical data stakeholders? Mm -hmm. Analytics engineers, software engineers, and random people who just wanted to learn about AI. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. awesome. So welcome everyone today. Now the panelists have an idea of who the presence of the audience here is. So with that, I'd love to kick it off. The title of this particular session is Be Brave, Modeling Data in the Face of Uncertainty. And so one of the things I'd love to start with, um, and I'll actually hand it off immediately to Victoria, how do we differentiate noise from viable data? Right. Okay. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this question um, because of the fact that Naturally, when you're working with data, noise can occasionally be something that's very real um, in your data, but it can also be just a matter of trying to figure out what the goals of the business are. So um, when you're when you're trying to like ideate what is considered noise, it's actually imp incredibly important as a data stakeholder to know what the corresponding KPIs that you're looking for within your business. So being able to isolate you know, whether or not you're in a growth stage, a profitability stage. Um, I actually took some notes here because I wanted to make sure I got everything down. Um, but understanding whether or not your business is in a growth in a growth stage, profitability stage, whether or not the goal is to grow market share, have innovation, or whether or not it's to isolate operation. So once you're actually able to isolate what the goals of your business are specifically, before then, 
don't even worry about like noise is not the problem. Um, once you're once you're there um, and you're you know you've you've have some sort of infrastructure, some kind of application that you're using to create viable um, you know your where you're gaining your insights from, um, it's going to be important to sort of uh, run that algorithm over time so that you can see what it is it which is um, basically like your outliers versus what is like, you know, the common, um, oh, I'm going to forget the word I need, but the common, uh, yeah, your common denominator. It's, it's, it's the thing. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so that's going to be over time. That's a model that's going to constantly be iterated upon, right? And so it's, it can't, it's definitely not going to be something that is, um, one and done, but just to remain vigilant as you start to get more data as you go in. It's never going to work as like, okay, I set up this model, it works. Um, sometimes with non-technical stakeholders, you can be you know, looking for a solution immediately, but it is something that does require fine tuning. Um, and yeah, that's sort of the main commentary I have for that. Yeah, any mm. other input from the panelists? I mean, I would say like, you know, for me, it kind of comes on to the use cases, right? Yes. Just especially if you're, you know, in a research kind of a project, uh, noise is very critical. Like, you know, you need to really make sure you understand where is it coming from. Mm. In a business setup, like, you know, you're always continuously improving and evolving, right? So you're always trying to put it something out there, test it, and see what happens next, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's how I, I kind of say it. Awesome. And so thinking about now building that architecture that you had touched on, Victoria, that will be iterated over time, um, how does one build a scalable data architecture within their growing company? Um, how do you measure growth within your data? And so with that, um, let's have it go to Zara to start and kick us off. How do we scale architecture? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think because I think as data scientists, the first thing everyone's trying to do, and I think Megan and Dylan said this yesterday, is you want to collect all the data you possibly can. Um, because a lot of times you don't know what will be important until you, later you go back and do that exploratory analysis. So I think the first thing is, is sort of thinking about how you collect the data. Because to do any modeling problem, it's easiest when you have the data in one place. And so that's a, sort of a day one decision is like thinking about having a, a plan of attack for how you're going to collect the data. Uh, I think the next the next piece is sort of being conscious of what stage of scale you are. Um, we are a tiny company. We're a year old. And so we've gone through the journey of, of stage one, like where, where can we just store the basic basic user feedback? Where, where do we store um, sort of our events data? And so I think the kind of step one is starting where you kind of at the, at the very beginning, doing things manually. So at, when you start modeling something, how do you do this to yourself? And then thinking about how do you generalize that? And so that's where you get into storing uh, labels, then bigger warehouses, things like BigQuery. Um, yeah. Um, I would also like to add to that, um, that absolutely agree. Um, I think one way to think about it though, is also to kind of start thinking about your data in a tiered fashion. You know, not all of your data needs to be super fast, super quickly accessed. Maybe you need data from the last, you know, two days. Maybe you need it from the last year. And some queries can run a longer time. Some things can take a while. So, you know, that's kind of when you start thinking about pricing, because if you need your petabytes of data all in memory, like, yeah, that's going to be freaking expensive. And you cannot really like have that as a part of your business model. So once you started thinking about like what data can you really like offload into an archive, into, um, you know, a data lake, uh, what is your tolerance for latency for those things? So tiering, I think, is a, definitely one of the approaches that you need to consider as you're building out your data architecture. And then the second thing I would mention is that it's important to, and this kind of goes back to your first question, um, to the first question that we had, which is, uh, think about your data model. Think about the actual data that you need. Do you really, really need all the data that you're collecting to answer the questions that you have? Because very often, you know, like, especially as data people, 
we get excited about the data and we want all of it, but you usually don't need all of it to answer the questions that you have. And of course your questions evolve, but at that point your data model needs to evolve. So, you know, I'll take like a second to plug MongoDB or actually really any um, non um, SQL database because you have data flexibility as you are adding data to it. So when you're thinking about modeling your data, think about using products that allow you to have that evolution down the line. And I'm going to add it with something controversial. No, it's not that controversial. Um, uh, so basically something that I've like, I've worked with a lot of startups, both pre-seed, seed, right. Um, you know, varying from size from like just two or three people to literally hundreds. Um, and I've personally found that uh, the most successful data teams, whether that's one person or larger, is are data teams that function sort of in a mirrored fashion that traditional engineering teams tend to work in. Um, to create scalable models, it can be easy for data teams to be stuck in a position where they're like constantly trying to fulfill metrics, um, which can like lead to a lot of tech debt, lead to, um, you know, sort of uh, without the ability to actually like build models and implement data engineering and implement analytics engineering, you can be stuck in a position where your analysts are just scrambling all the time and you can't really work with building anything on top of that. Um, very successful analytics teams usually will allocate somewhere around 60 to 75% of their time actually coming up with like the research analysis, working on trying to figure out that the other remaining time, uh, part of that time should be allocated to building to up your data engineering and your analytics engineering structure. There, every single time, um, you know, you have a question, instead of having your analysts like running back, trying to like repurpose the pieces, having them like have something that's built upon where they can access that same question in one second um, allows for sort of growth over time. That's my controversy. <laughs> Awesome. And so building off of that, and particularly one of the things that you had said, Susanna, how can you predict the types of data you need so as not to overspend or over allocate on the data capture and acquisition for the company? So Susanna, I'll let you start off with that since you touched on it a little bit in the last one. Right. And, uh, the constraint always is money, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, yeah. You know, you can't know the future, right? So this kind of goes to the point I was trying to make where as you are creating your um, engineering or your data stack as well, mm -hmm. try to use products that allow you to have that evolution because like your data needs, your engineering needs all evolve. So, you know, choosing tools that enable that evolution tends to be beneficial. Um, in addition to that, it's also, I think, um, about being proactive about how you're using things like, you know, nobody loves analyzing their AWS bill, right? But um, eventually you got to do it and you got to shut down those really like expensive machines that you're using for machine learning um, because they're running over the weekend. So like being proactive about those kind of things can really help you um, figure out how to be efficient and effective in how you're allocating your resources. But like, yeah, I would say spend time and money on things that enable you to um, change and evolve. And at the same time, like be to some extent proactive. Don't just like throw your data into a data lake because then sometimes you can't get it out. Like, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I have a customer <laughs> dealing with this right now. They sent everything into an archive and they can't get it out. So like, you know, plan a little bit <laughs> and it can be really hard, right? Like this is an obvious thing to say, but when you're moving really, really fast and you have like customer deadlines to meet, like acquiring that tech debt can absolutely be a problem that your company faces. So that's like why, you know, basic advice, but like still valuable because we forget it when we are moving really fast and then it ends up costing millions of dollars. Again, like <laughs> not joking. <laughs> yeah. And so... You know, with that, Tarun, one of the things that we had talked about before the panel um, was how not to reinvent the wheel. So we're talking about building scalable architecture. We're talking about building um, within a budget. 
how do we know what to kind of do from scratch internally versus what we can take from plugins or things that already exist? And, and how do you really understand that balance? Yeah, I think for me, like not reinventing the wheel is like a day-to-day -day motto in partner. Uh, the, to be honest, like to not rein the wheel, like, you really need to understand the problem you're solving, right? You really need to know what is the, where is the pain point? Like, you know, what are the solutions that are out there, right? Mm -hmm. You need to do thorough research about it. Uh, then if it really comes down to that, that, you know, if some of the existing solutions cannot be used, sometimes they can be tweaked, right? Mm -hmm. You can use some of the APIs and you can manipulate the data or maybe you can reach out to those providers and ask them about some custom solution they can do for you, right? But if worse come worse, if you had to do something in-house, I would always say like, try to be as minimalist as possible in your development, right? Mm -hmm. Keep it easy, keep it something that you can test, something you can easily evaluate success, right? Um, because there's always this engineering trend, like you always try to solve everything, right? Mm -hmm. You you go for the ultimate solution and then the first thing you see is the data is not right, right? <laughs> and then you, you start reverse, reverse engineering, you try to like, you know, figure out other ways around, but you kind of hold on to the solution, right? So yeah, always try to look into the cost benefit of, uh, is it worth it doing something from scratch, even if something is not there and always take it in steps. I think you'll always find your way out. Yeah. The other panelists have thoughts on that? Um, yeah, it's actually, so this is a sort of funny story. I'll be super quick, but um, uh, a friend of mine had uh, posted a, like a, a hot take on hacker news that got like thousands of likes or whatever, which was trying to push like the, you know, the idea of like using open source for like managing all of your, your databases and, and whatnot. Um, and you know, not to throw them under the bus, but it is like a matter of being able to uh, get that cost benefit because with open source, you do have freedom, you do have flexibility, you have a lot of things that you can use. However, anything goes wrong, you are the one who's going to be all night debugging what's up with your data. So it's like, you know, if you don't have that type of time bandwidth, endless time bandwidth, uh, you might want to spend the extra bill. <laughs> so. I thousand percent agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, open source, and again, like we have an open source product. We also have a paid version for Mongo. So just from our Mongo perspective, open source is great. We do it. However, <laughs> like you're going to spend that engineering time and effort on it. So it's not actually free. Like, you know, full stop, those two engineers, three engineers, eventually like an engineering team managing that deployment. Mm -hmm that's not free. The infrastructure is not free. So open source, is just not free, full stop. And <laughs> that's where, you know, you can analyze and figure out like, oh, is it better to, you know, do it in like this cloud or that cloud or, you know, whatever else. And you do have the support. The other thing I was going to mention is that once you are building out your own stuff, and again, this is obvious advice, so like not super <laughs> breakthrough, but follow the best practices, you know, <laughs> like everyone has them. They are out there. <laughs> they get broken all the time you know like i get customer questions all the time that are like i did this like is it right no it's also on our website right here please like just read it so read <laughs> if i were to add I, I was taking it from the modeling side uh and i think your your advice is such universally applicable uh but i think for me like there's it's so rare that you're deploying like one model in isolation like, mm -hmm. usually there's sort of these systems of systems and so your noise multiplies like every every model and so whenever you're building it yourself and i think for us we try to think about like can we really beat the accuracy of something on the on the market and so especially we operate in the world of text so when you're thinking about like if you can use someone if someone else has trained something that does entity extraction can you leverage that and fine tune it instead of having to recreate every sample and data cleaning that they did? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how uh, we think about it is like really trying to be really picky of when we think we have a competitive <laughs> advantage on fine tuning or building our own model. Mm -hmm. So knowing your own strengths. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So building off this idea, and I'll start with you here, Zara. Everyone thinks about building a startup, not everyone, but there's a lot of ideas out there thinking about building lean startups. How do I start in a lean manner before I go out and raise VC, for example? Mm -hmm. On the other side, a lot of the times you hear the most data you can get, the better. So how do you balance that idea? How do you have a lean startup, but also have that viable data source? 
Yeah, I mean, this has been such an internal conflict this year because I think you're kind of two two sides of your brain are at war. Where on the one hand, you want to get as fast as you can to providing value to users, which lets you iterate and make sure you're building the right thing for them. And on the other hand, you want to validate your technology. So you want to make sure that you can do something that's unique in the market, that's a game changer. And so for us, I, you know, I think there's a, there's different. Uh, measures of success or different things you're optimizing for. There's one like how fast can you get your model deployed? Mm. How accurate is it for the user? Mm. How robust is it to changing uh, like distributions of data or how scalable is it? And for us, I think early on, we throw scalability out the window and focus on accuracy. And that accuracy can mean you put a person in front of the model where if it's only 80% accurate, there's someone whose job is to like monitor and say like, we're gonna check the output before you release it. Mm -hmm. um, and then focusing, so that's like, you're making sure you're providing that something to the user early, which lets you sort of iterate and make sure it's worth doubling down on building that more accurate model. Uh, but then within that, I think the other thing we ask ourselves is like, what are the key pieces of technology that we need to verify? So like, where do we have that unique advantage? And what's that place that we need to double down and build something really unique and really specialized here? And so that's where we sort of build that angle is starting off, you know, it doesn't need a scale. It doesn't necessarily need to be, it, it needs to be fast to deploy and it needs to be accurate. But the other two, you know, you can can work and build out over time. So that's how we've been starting that. I mean, I would like to add, like, you know, when it comes to lean startups and all, right? Like, when you get started, there is nothing absolutely right. So you can plan for 10x, <laughs> right? Yeah. But your starting point need not be, like, 10 times bigger, right? Start, think small, right? If you're able to build something that can scale 10x, I think you're good. And then as you're growing, you can continuously iterate on those things, right? You don't really need to start on, like, you know, oh, how can I get, like, maybe figure out your sensitivity around your data, right? On your problem you're solving, right? Maybe sometimes the 99% accuracy is what you need. And sometimes maybe 95 is good enough to put it out there to see the use cases, right? And the user acceptance, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of the times I've heard of, of my engineers, when we give them a spec from the as a non-technical stakeholder, they'll say, well, do we really need that spec? Or is something else good enough? And that's always the counter, right? And I think that's a great thing to put out there. Victoria, go ahead. Yeah, another another controversial take. Um, the so the idea of having like all the data, um, like as much data collected as possible, is something I think when I first started, I was a hundred percent on this boat. I'm like, what if we need like historical data or whatnot? Um, I've found in my general experience that that is almost never the case. And while sometimes occasionally can be painful when you find yourself in, you know, like posts saying, I wish I had a metric, I wish I had the ability to track this. Um, it's almost always better to have deployed that after you realized you need it than to have, you know, just like copious amounts of data just being stored and whether you don't need, know if you need it. Um, because of the fact if the model, like right, if the acquisition was faulty at the time and you weren't like looking at the, like how, as you were storing it in your database, like it's not like, it's not only not helpful, it's useless and you just have to like reformat again. Um, so that's like, I, I lean towards don't be the person who wants to collect all of your, like all of your data um, before knowing that you need it. Awesome. Yeah. So I think many of us here in the audience might have heard the term garbage in, garbage out. This mm -hmm. idea that if your data is noisy going in, coming out, you're not really training on data that has um, high power, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So for our panelists here, how can we prevent a garbage in, garbage out data modeling approach during acquisition? And are there any checks and balances that we can put in place early on to ensure that this won't happen? So, Susanna, I'll start with you first, and, and we can pass it to the others. Sure. Um, so, I think this one depends a lot on your use case as well. Mm -hmm. So, we keep, I think, trending towards this thing, right, where we say, like, you should have a specific question, you should have specific use cases that you're trying to target, mm -hmm. and it's the same thing for data cleanliness, you know. Um, you're going to need different features um, for a specific model that you are building. So, it ends up coming back to figuring out what it is that you need and then spending that time cleaning your data, labeling it, assuming you're doing you know, something that's, um, that requires you to do machine learning on top of it. Um, I think with certain other use cases, right, with um, maybe like 
chatbots. Um, now things have changed quite a lot with generic AI. The focus is in different places. It's not, the emphasis is still to some extent on the data. Again, like mm -hmm. you still need good data to train your gener um, generative AI on top of it because you can just throw, well, you can throw a lot of things at it, but don't throw the whole internet at it yet, <laughs> right? So um, you still want to be, um, you still want to understand your data. And I think this is a point that sometimes gets missed um, by customers where they don't involve SMEs early enough for specific use cases that they have. So, you know, like if you're an insurance company and you want a really, really good chatbot to answer questions all about insurance, you want to, the people who are actually working on this, they should also understand it. You at least need one SME to kind of like be there to just do like a sanity check to do all of that. Like maybe they're not going to do all of your data cleansing. You can have, you can do it yourself. You can have a data scientist do it, but like don't skip over the SMEs or involve them after the fact. So, and what's a SME? Oh my God. I'm so sorry. Subject matter <laughs> expert. Subject matter Subject expert. Subject matter expert. Right. So you want to have um, people who are domain experts in the room architecting the solution with you. So it's not so much about like how you clean your data, but also like, I think to some extent what people are involved with the project. Anyone else? Yeah, I have I have so many so many thoughts here. I, I feel like this is the question of the panel, or honestly, like the the entire year is, uh, like if you look at even the most advanced machine learning, like the Llama two paper, the Facebook. There's this in the introduction, as there's a whole section that says quality is all you need. And what they said their innovation was they made a really really clean sample set of like twenty six thousand samples, and it was so much better than all the like half garbage labeled data that people were using before. And so I think it's it's something that I, I'm really excited about. There's this push towards data centric AI, which is saying that so many of us were taught in school how to build models and then try to go deploy them in the real world and realize that like 90% of the problem is just cleaning the data. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and I feel like, like the, what Susanna said, like the first is like, if you have a person who knows the field and can look at the features and be like, actually like these columns, the fact that this one, like the, the end date is less than the start date, that's a problem. So like, the, I think that's the, the initial heuristic. Then like, you know, you can automate some of those checks. Um, you can use things like automated anomaly detection to check for, for outliers and like getting at, at the problem uh, Victoria mentioned of like, when you have crazy outliers, if you think of the model as a kindergartner, it, it's really hard to learn all the exceptions for string theory when you don't know one plus one equals two. And so like removing some of those, and then there's like more crazy things you can do with your feature engineering. But I, I uh, it, it's exciting, I think now with these like data centric AI toolkits that like people are empowering this data cleaning step. And I think to that point, you know, when you take like a, um, a more generic AI, uh, you can also then make it more specific to your industry. And mm -hmm. we see those AIs performing a lot better mm -hmm. than the generic ones yeah. for obvious reasons, yeah. right? But like, it's still um, something that like, matters to the companies making those investments. Mm -hmm. I think just doubling down on understanding data, right? <laughs> understanding the source from where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. Sometimes like if the data is internal, it's a bit more easier. And if you're getting the data from third party providers, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to sit with them, understand how they're collecting it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that will give you like a lot of insight in the beginning and all the outliers, right? Everything that has been mentioned will really go a long way in uh, making sure that you're not collecting garbage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. And so next question here, we touched upon it a little bit as we were talking. Um, how can we prepare our data for generative AI? So we know the launch of OpenAI's ChatGPT is out there. Enterprise is already, you know, really <laughs> in everyone's home, I would say. Um, so I'll start with Victoria. How can we prepare our data for generative AI, knowing what we have available at our fingertips? Yeah, I think that there's going to, right, there's going to be half of this is going to be about uh, preventing bias, right, and like making sure that you have, like, if whatever your, your source for your AI models are, it's going to be something that is a mo like a representation of what you have. Um, but also, uh, there has been so, I've been doing endless reading on the prompt engineering, right? It's like, I feel like the big buzzword when it comes to AI. Um, as far as like they're like what I say now probably won't even be relevant in six months <laughs> just because of the way that it's it's working. But I think uh, very closely to what you at all said about being able to create like a very specific, clean like model that is like without any of the extra crap, right? On all of this, 
um, is definitely going to be like the initial basis of what you're basing your models on. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but yeah, I, I yeah, because I could see your eyes yeah. lighting up <laughs> while I'm saying this. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah I, I completely. I'm very excited about this space. Um, <laughs> so stop me, cut me off. But I, I think like because machine learning modeling is always about asking the right question. Right. Yeah. And so I feel like there's you know you can ask the wrong question and it's going to hallucinate garbage and you're going to yep. show it to your users and they're not going to trust you. But I think half of it is like kind of knowing like what you said like wh what's coming before it and so if you give it some crazy distribution and ask it a vague question the output is going to be not only is the output itself going to change but sometimes like the formats could change like you might want yamls and it's going to be json's like mm -hmm. asking a very specific question and it's i think just learning unfortunately like learning to communicate it like it's a, a peer mm -hmm. uh, but yeah and i think i think that's that's the uh, like from our experience using the large language models in the last year, it's like figuring out where in the system is it, when is the system drifting, how is the output changing, um, and then making sure, you know, there's some ethical things like don't put PII in. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but definitely keep, keep an eye just for um, the, like, just the term prompt engineering. I feel like I looked that up and it just sent me on a spot, a wonderful spiral of information, so. Um. <laughs> Just anecdotally, so I um, I worked on enterprise search for quite a while, and like from the engineering is so fascinating because the minute you give your users um, an input box that's not controlled by anything. <laughs> they will do everything to it. Like you will get the kind of queries that like your, your AI can't be ready for because you wouldn't be ready for them, you know? Like, so the way that like people abuse Google where they just like type in and hit the keyboard, like that's the same thing is going to keep happening. And somehow like our AIs will need to be able to handle someone, you know, half forming a thought and then giving them the right information, which again, such a fascinating field. And actually yesterday in one of the data sessions, we were talking about, regenerative AI, and someone had brought up another type of anecdote where they had asked, um, give me a job description for a software engineer. And it immediately responded with he, just because a lot of the data out there, there's a lot more men potentially that have software engineering positions. So kind of building off that idea, Victoria, of how to create an unbiased um, prompt, so to speak, how do we even, how do we start knowing that this exists? I feel like it's it's definitely iterative like it won't it's it's definitely going to be a matter of trying something you know unfortunately right right now at, we're at that stage where we're still under development but it's like you know trying something and then realizing sort of in post that that is not quite what you're looking for mm -hmm. um everything's been changing so like everything's been changing with each um Word. Iteration. Thank you. You've been I got you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, this is prompt completion, right? Right here. Um, <laughs> with every, yeah, with every version. So, um, you know, it, it is going to be a matter of yeah. trial and error. Yeah, trial and error for now. Yeah, for now. So um, we're talking about AI and building all these models, um, but there might be individuals who have data that don't necessarily need AI or can yes, use an Excel absolutely. spreadsheet just fine. Um, so Tarun, why don't you kick off, when do you know when you would need AI versus when you should just do some lower level stats and be on your way? For me, it really comes down to what is the value you're trying to do or what is the <laughs> problem you're trying to solve, right? For example, you could be a SaaS platform, right? The use case, AI might help, might not help, right? You could be a service-based company, right? So where does AI come in in terms of that? Like, you know, is it the primary value that is driving your users to come back to you? Or is it something you want to optimize down the line, right? Or you could be like an, you're trying to build like an optimizer solution, like, you know, then maybe AI becomes really critical in terms of the output, the value you're driving. I think understanding those things will go a long way in uh, whether you want to start something thinking AI or you want to start something like, hey, let me just get going, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think due to the whole buzz around AI, it might seem like you know, everything needs to start there, but I don't think it needs to, like, you know, every company will eventually get there as the data increases, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as a problem you're trying to solve becomes, it's you no, know, it's about the tiny bit of efficiency that comes at million users compared to that efficiency at uh, maybe if you have just 100 users, right? Mm -hmm. So things on those lines, I think that will, if you keep focusing on the value that you are giving to your customers, I think that will tell you when to make those pivots 
in terms of improving your data struct like you know data stack literally yeah and so in terms of data cleaning a lot of you had mentioned making sure that your data was clean that it was specific for the role that you don't need too much extra garbage so to speak to make it noisier um what are some strategies for implementing data cleaning and and kind of how can we share with users what that process could look like go ahead to victoria okay all right so this is this is sort of i'm reiterating back what i had said before about how like 70 to 75 percent should be fulfilling metrics and the other half should be like data engineering and and, and structure quality quality assurance and whatnot. Um, with that, uh, whoa, sorry. Um, so with that, uh, definitely being able to get like QA as close to the data collection phase as possible um, will save a lot of headache in the end. It is so much better to take an extra week um, you know, and I understand that sometimes you want to have like quick turnaround time, but taking the extra week or the extra few days to make sure that you're doing test outputs, um, you know, and just running the like the tests in, in all sorts of crazy ways and then just reevaluate like evaluating what that output looks like rather than, you know, risking having, you know, just a bunch of bugs that need to be fixed afterwards. So naturally, as time goes on, you have a more developed business, you might have a data team that has more experience in, in implementing um, things. But, you know, that does come with like a price tag with, you know, having um, the amount of experience versus like what your salary is, or, or what that amount of time that's worth. Um, so, you know, as it gets more like less expensive, make sure you take that extra time. It will save you in the end, even if it takes a little bit of extra time. So that's mine. And so my yeah. next question, I think a lot of people <clears throat> will describe a startup like you're building a plane while it's flying. <laughs> so there's a lot going on. You're trying to keep the plane in the air. Mm -hmm. What trade-offs would we have with reliability versus speed of execution. And I'd love to really tap into Zara and Susanna here um, to kind of get their inputs on, on how you would make that trade-off and what decisions you need to do in advance. Yeah, I think, well, to echo things people already said, I, I think, uh, especially at our stage when we're pre-product market fit, you know, mm -hmm. we're trying to work on the zero to one, there's very few times where we've waited to deliver something and we've actually, like, thought that was a good decision, like getting something in front of users is so valuable, especially at our stage. And so for us, you know, we don't, we can throw scale a little bit out the window for now, but uh, I think is reliability does matter for the user trust. And so the way we handle that is saying, you know, we, we can do things without scale. And so we will manually verify, sit in front of the model and say like, you said, this is correct. Do we, do I, does Zara think this is correct? And so that's how we handle sort of the user trust side until we get the models to where we, we trust them. I think for me, like I can take off two prior work, work examples, right? <laughs> I worked with a bank where they're trying to send mails to so that people can accept uh, offers they're giving out there. I think there, I think the speed is more important than reliability, right? You could go off even by 5%, nothing happens, right? But I worked in an agriculture sector where they are forwarding seeds in terms of uh, like you know, uh, the breeding aspect of it. Now there you definitely need some accuracy, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't uh, risk anything out there. So I think it really comes down to what you're trying to solve. And I think uh, you can make right decisions with them. Yeah, I would just add that um, as you're thinking through whatever the use case may be, whatever the right decision may be, you're also looking at your constraints, right? Like time is a constraint, um, money is a constraint. Those are the kind of things we always have to work with. When we are architecting solutions, we're also, you know, money translates to RAM, to disk. So um, when we are talking about speed and reliability and scalability, once we get there, um, <laughs> you know, we are thinking within those constraints. Like if money and time are not an issue, then we can, you know, all create everything all the time <laughs> and you roll it out to customers and be millionaires, right? But like, you have those constraints, so you need to prioritize things because of those constraints. So um, kind of to what Tarun was just saying, like knowing 
your use case kind of being targeted in what you are doing, then you can also work within those limitations in a much more nuanced and thoughtful and um, intentional way. Mm -hmm. So that if you are spending X, Y, Z of engineering time or of, you know, of your budget on answering the question or rolling out the feature, you know, or you believe that this is going to have a true impact. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you need to um, be really fast and responsive because you're in a financial market and you need to be really in touch with like how the trades are being made, right? Like you need the speed there and you need the reliability. But if you're just running analytics on the trading data from that day, mm. Mm, do you need it to be as fast? Probably not. So like figure out how you can structure your architecture so that you can tier your data and tier your queries as well. It's about the questions you're asking of your data, not just the data itself. Mm-hmm. And so knowing the trade-offs between speed and reliability, timeline and budget, when do you know your model is done? Um, How do you know when you're finished? (laughs) And so, Victoria, why don't we kick off with you for this? Um, So there has to be a time where even when it's not finished, you got to walk away. Um, It is so, right, this is a very consistent feeling. Um, There has to be a so this is where it comes from, right? So it's always going to go back to the question, what stage of the business you are? Like if you're working with stakeholders, what are they looking for? If the model is enough to answer the question, then it's enough, right? If, right, you can say like that 95 confidence level when you're working with stats, right? Um, And you, or like, you can't get any more than that. Like 98 might be better, but that could be enough given the resources that you can work on something else that would be revenue generating. Um, It does always go back to money. Um, And so (laughs) with that said, um, it's never finished and it never feels finished. So um, once you can answer the question, it's my mom, wow. Um, uh, That's when you know. For me, like, uh, I'll go back to, like, you know, fall in love with the problem and not with the solution, right? Mm-hmm. I think when you define your problem, if you have clearly defined, like, you know, what is success, yeah. I think when those numbers are coming out, you will know. I mean, if just because you have been able to implement in the best possible way, you don't keep iterating on it, like, you know. Mm-hmm. I think especially mm-hmm. in a business setup, in a research, it could be a little bit different. But in a startup and in business, like, you know, you need to move fast. And mm-hmm. having those clear def- definitions right in the beginning will make sure that ambiguity is removed at the end. I think I have, I have two thoughts here. There's one's very technical, one's very anti-technical. Uh, but I think <laughs> the first is like sort of tracking how you're doing over time. And so like the, the machine learning answer is track your loss curve. Like how is your accuracy improving as you add more and more compute resources? But I think that also applies to your time. Like as you invest, if you track how is it improving after how much time you're spending on it, if you're different approach, you get to see like when you're hitting that diminishing returns. And so you can literally track your own progress. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then to what Tarun said, I think for everyone, no matter what your role is or what stage you are, everything is an opportunity cost. And if you're thinking about the problem, not just the solution you're working on, you get the chance to step back and be like, you know, what what is the opportunity cost? So I can be fixing this by building a model. I can be fixing this by cleaning the data. I can be fixing this by adding a button so that the user says, I hate this and be like really improving my data. Um, so I think that's where like you start to think like, you know, what am, what am I not doing by continuing to try to push this curve a little bit higher? Mm-hmm. I think that's a really good point. Like being able to change your approach how you're getting your data like the button thing um it's really really important so like you know sometimes as a data scientist or you know working in the data space you kind of end up getting a bucket of data and you can be kind of disjointed from the people who are getting the data so like don't be in that situation. That's my advice. You know, work with your engineering team, design UIs that actually drive the data experience that you want to deliver. Because Mm -hmm. it's not just like one part of the process, like it begins with your user. So knowing the question also allows you to add the options that you need to get from your user so that you have the data that you need. So Mm -hmm. add the button or get rid of it, you know, whatever. (laughs) So thinking about how companies and teams are very interdisciplinary, how do you translate your technical goals to the non-technical stakeholders and how can you potentially promote data literacy within an organization? Um, Yeah, go for it, Victoria. Building models, back to the, (laughs) I'm just reiterating. Um, So just out of like a show of hands, I just really quickly want to see, so how many people here are non-technical stakeholders? 
Okay. And then how many people would say that they're technical and employing? Okay. All right. Cool. I just wanted to get that um, breakdown. Um, so definitely when you're trying to translate, um, right, there are metrics that there's like an endless amount of research that happens for like uh, common metrics that all businesses should have. If your data team has not like come up with a way to model like customer acquisition costs, customer li like L CLTV, customer lifetime value, like your AOV, GMV, like depending, I'm in the e-commerce space, so that's sort of where that comes from. Um, but like you're, you definitely want to be focusing on just getting those metrics in a way where it's accessible to the stakeholder so that they don't constantly have to be going to the data team to get those, right? In the form of a dashboard, data visualization, whether it's something that's sent like through email or whatever, however you want to do it, make sure that that is available, like readily available in a way to all non-technical stakeholders. Um, it will be the basis in creating some sort of um, sort of like learning experience between communicating with non-technical people and translating that to sort of more complex testing and metrics, AB, like future A-B testing that you might want to do. Um, so once, once that is sort of established where you get into that form of self-service, right, that's where you can start introducing uh, more opportunities for uh, like stakeholders to be able to think technically. Um, I think, does anybody want to add to that? So um, as a part of my role, so as a solutions architect, we talk mm -hmm. to non-technical people about our technology all the time. Um, so that's kind of been my sandbox for a, quite a while now. And um, I think, honestly, it really comes down to empathy and being able to empathize mm -hmm. with your non-technical folk because, um, you know, like technology can be hard and scary sometimes, right? So like kind of knowing that all of us don't know everything like across the board and kind of leaning into that and mm -hmm. being more um, there as an advisor and somebody who can help is really, really important. Um, that being said, uh, I also think that you really need to understand the so what, you know, like you're doing this data cleansing, mm -hmm. data modeling, all this like super cool chat, um, GPT stuff, like, so what? You know, what is the so what that has an impact on your user, on your company, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And getting very, very like, clear and concise about the so what um, improves business communication in general. You know, um, if you're talking to a CEO, yeah, they think you made a really cool graph too, but they don't know what it's saying unless you can tell it to them in like a really clear, concise way. So um, that's one thing. And then for any kind of like venture C-level kind of stuff, practice, 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 especially like if you are technical, you get maybe sometimes a little bit jittery doing a big presentation practice it and again i'm the, here with the basic advice so so sorry about that but it's something that makes a huge difference you know like practice your demos practice your pitch practice 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 and that way you get much more comfortable communicating your message because you yourself own it a little bit better so that the so what becomes a second nature and that the evidence that you have to support it is there to support it but it, it's not the end of all i would say Something you know, just really, really quickly I wanted to add to that is it also helps that if you are presenting data in any capacity, have like a very simplistic, like just like one page, like of what it is you're trying to communicate. And if anybody there is more interested in what it is you have to say, put that, oops, sorry, put all of that extra information somewhere else so that they can read further. Try not to just read the whole thing. Um, basically focusing on what, why, yeah. Why does it matter? I, I think I'm going to echo what you said, but <laughs> I, I, I think for me, it's like the mindset, the context, and the implementation, what's hard. Um, and, and for me, I think the first thing in the mindset, like it's easy to get excited. Like I just did it in this, and I was like, I want to talk about llama. I want to talk about loss curves. Uh, <laughs> but usually, if I feel like if you actually know something, you can make it simple. And so coming into the conversation and be like, what is like the two things I want to get across? And I think it really helps, at least for me, like it helps you also come up in your own mind. Like, what is the point of this? And really like nail the so what of what you're doing. Uh, and then I think the second is the context. So like taking like a step back and then taking two more step backs of like, really, why are we doing this? It's not because we want to improve the accuracy or increase our 
click-through rate. We want our users to love the product or we want this customer to convert. And so really zooming out until you like reach that common ground where you're aligned. And then for me, like the last part is, you know, I think one of the biggest questions people get are like timelines. And, you know, especially for engineers, we love to say something's going to be done in a month and then it's going to be done in four. <laughs> and so like mitigating that uh, and trying to say like, this is the hard part. Like when we get to this stage, this is the part that's uncertain. This is the part that's certain. So we're trying to get to this stage. And then after that, you can really trust our estimate, I think is the third part that I really try to communicate there. Generally, like KPIs, right? Like KPIs are a good way, especially with the non-business stakeholders, like, you know, and it, it, it doesn't matter. It could be performance of the, like what the project or anything, right? Having it clearly defined will help. And also believe like, you know, you need to keep people in loop, right? Just going with the output does not always help, right? Maybe have some initial discovery sessions, right? So they understand what you are trying to achieve. And at the same time, you understand the business side of it, right? I think converting uh, data into a business uh, language is one of the toughest challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially when you're growing, if you're able to do that more efficiently, I generally see like, you know, you unlock a lot more potential within the company than before. So we have just about 10 minutes left. And with that, I'd love to open questions up to the audience as well as to the, the chat and those that are virtually attending. So do we have any questions here in the audience? We'll bring you over a microphone. So I have a validation and um, and a question. Uh, what I heard you say in, in general um, was that process really matters. So whether it's uh, a, a technical build, what I heard you from a data sense was follow your process, follow your use cases, really understand it, take your steps, you know, build out your MVP kind of of your data. Don't don't rush it and don't store too much data. Is that correct? If kind of broadly, okay. Um, and the question is um, for startups. Um, currently, I'm in a SaaS startup. I also advise several other smaller companies. Um, at what point do they bring a uh, bring a data analyst in? Because from a you know, if I'm building an MVP of a product, I'm getting it out to customers. Data is different than building out the tech. Uh, you know, where does that um, come to me? What when do I have that person come aboard on a part time or full time basis? Uh, I can answer uh, for us. I'm, I think we'll have very different answers here. Uh, so for us, the data is our, our bread and butter. So our data engineer, analyst, scientist, wizard was our first hire. She's sitting right there. <laughs> and so it was our first thing is we need the data to work. Um, but I think I suspect it's very, very different uh, across, you know, like consumer tech and uh, logistics. Uh, I think the other thing I, I did want to emphasize, like the, the process on, you know, I, I came from more of a software engineering background and then ended up doing data things. Um, but I think for me, like there's a lot of process around doing software engineering well from like like commit histories, like design docs, like having scalability. And I think one thing that I, like, you know, it's just an adjustment is getting through like figuring out that process of, of how do you prototype, build something rules-based, build something with a simple model, like a fine-tuned model. Uh, and like that escalation process is something that, you know, it took us, you know, time to define and, and make sure we roll out correctly. I think for me, like, it really comes down to the skill set of your team, right? If there is not even one person who knows how to even put together in a data in an Excel sheet or something, then I would definitely try to bring in someone. Especially in a SaaS platform, you really want to understand what users are clicking, what are they up to, right? And it's not tough, like, you know, if you really put uh, all those uh, Google, like, you know, touch points, pixel touch points, right? It is very easy for someone to just interpret it, right? If, so if you do not have even that level of... Uh, skill set within the company for whatever reason, right? Then I think it's important to bring that visibility. Mm -hmm. You will see that that will change a lot. Um, again, it kind of, for me, like for us, like initially, like I was the, I was familiar with the data so I was putting together, but only I would know, I wouldn't have communicated, right? Soon we realized that when you put it out there, everyone starts thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't become like an engineer problem. It becomes like a company, business problem, right? So I think having, putting that visibility as soon as possible will go a long way in understanding why something is working and not working. Um, so based off of um, just the personal experience I've had, so like beyond being head of analytics before, I actually 
um, worked at a startup incubator, which was helping small companies become revenue positive within their first year or first two years. Um, and I usually find that when you want to have someone, so is the, just for clarification, is the question when you should start implementing data or when you should start having like someone who is there full time devoted to like building insight based off of data that you have? Yeah, so I think based off of my experience, the second that you find yourself starting to pull resources into a direction that has enough, um, I guess, like emphasis on whether or not it's like a make or break situation, right, where it's like, you're asking yourself the question, I'll put an example, like a concrete example, should I be focusing more on acquisition or retention right now? And you can pour your resources into acquisition. And if that doesn't work, that strategy doesn't work, your business can fail or something can, that will like greatly hinder your performance versus if you focus on retention or some other aspect of the business. Once those questions start to be like a make or break situation, that's when you can start having someone who's devoted to data so that you can have um, start growing like a strategy with how you're allocating your time and money. Um, in the like beginning portion, sometimes it's like, okay, yeah, we're just like working with the punches here. But as you get more advanced, you're starting to like grow with a larger like set of people or, or you know, trying to allocate money, trying to get funding. And, you know, you're going to want data to show to potential investors of like how you're starting to actually use money responsibly. That's around the time where you're going to want to dedicate a data person. Yeah. Any other questions here in the audience? Right there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've learned a lot uh, at this uh, panel. So my, my question for you would be, uh, how did you find your use case specifically for your application for language models as opposed to, you know, other possible uh, use cases? What was uh, the, the driving behind that? Yeah, so a little bit uh, part of this is my co-founder. So he was a diplomat in the Australian Foreign Service. And as a diplomat, he was sent to countries. And he says it was the most manual version of this for his job was to say, is this protest a really big deal and going to escalate into something that affects our interests? Or is this just something that happens every week? Um, so part of that, that gave us the broad field where we want to take events and we want to show people what matters to them. Uh, but then like that's super vague. So then it's been the year, the year journey is like figuring out what's the most sticky thing um, where people, you know, have a problem that needs solving. And for us, I think the the first, I, I forgot who, whose quote this is, but we're, you know, we try to emphasize and not building a robot that replaces people, but building a bicycle that makes people move faster and more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And so finding for us those use cases like, you know, for our, like financial fraud with some of our, one of our initial uh, markets is, is finding a use case where we can really empower analysts to do things that they're doing more effectively. Um, and then, you know, after that, like we honestly did a lot of exploration and then you start to feel, you know, you start to feel like these, this is a repeatable use case. This is a problem that people are excited about. They know their face lights up when you talk about it. So mm -hmm. that's been some of our journey. Thanks guys. Um, coming from a uh, consulting background, um, I used to go into, clients and um, half the time things that that you know to, to improve their processes um, or help them with with competitive advantage and um, oftentimes they just they didn't need like half of the reports and the things that they thought that they needed um, and uh, I think it's it's helpful for the you know the, the technology teams to be able to push back and I'm just wondering, what what kind of strategies do you guys uh, take to push back on the on the business side? <laughs> okay, great. That's an awesome question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I think this this is a lot of a lot of different flavors. Um, I I think that. Honestly, like the, I think that the first step is like sort of the opportunity cost. So like, you know, for us, it's like, well, we're doing this, these five things. Which one do you want off the list? And that usually is the you know the first <laughs> first way to push back. Uh, but but I think also, you know, 
I think as we're, you know, I think one thing that, you know, since we're small, as we try to really align every single person, whether or not they're a backend engineer, front end engineer, data, data scientist, or our CEO, to really trying to like focus on the user pain point. So it's like sort of a mutual, a mutual decision on like, we all agree this is really valuable because the user needs this, uh, which helps on alignment and uh, those debates. Uh, and I think, I think the third thing is like, it's sort of like breaking down, like, kind of what's what's next on, on the roadmap. And so I think we're constantly in this, like we do weekly planning, we do monthly planning, we do quarterly planning, and we have like vague ideas of our yearly roadmap, but trying to think of like, if we don't do this today, like, is there something that we could do in a month that will replace this? And so we don't really need it as urgently um, and, and getting to the, like those, and that, that sort of helps us at least figure out like, is this, you know, is this a, a, something vitamin that's sort of like nice to have, or is this something that's like, really solving that urgent problem today? Um, but those is some big, big answers. For me, as a product manager, I spend most of the time <laughs> saying a no <laughs> than uh, saying a yes, right? So for me, like, like if it's a very technical thing, then I would definitely reach out to the technical part of the team and try to understand the cost and the time and timelines, right? It sounds amazing from business when it comes, but you know, like, <laughs> this is not going to see the end of the life, right? Mm. Because business starts something today and next month they can reprioritize everything. Things change, right? So knowing that time sensitivity and eventually the cost of doing that, keeping it clear. Uh, and then like, you know, again, like always finding some alternate ways of doing it might, would be the best way for me. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I think if it's really needed, right. Generally, like you do not see such deficit that would be like immediately needed. Right. Until, until something has been not looked into for years. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you keep improving, generally you do not find that bigger gaps. So I think like knowing that uh, things will help. Yeah. I feel like right now with, with AI, everyone's like, you know, it's a <laughs> shiny object. Mm -hmm. Everyone yeah. wants to do it. It's like more than some sort of AI technology. Yep. Um, and it's just like, you know, I need, I need this excitement. <laughs> stop, stop with the, uh, you know, the, the craziness focus on it. Yeah. I think it's about getting their skin in the game a little bit, you know, like, if you have a customer who has um who's kind of like running around kind of like trying to just do something really cool with, cool with chat gpt or what have you you know the question then becomes like okay well you really want to do chat gpt give me the resources to do this with you well you know whether that's like through a poc that you sponsor whether it's through um you know defining exactly what the scope is in collaboration with somebody who is higher up within that organization that owns the budget and so on and so forth so like you know getting kind of laser focused on the use case as we've been saying but at the same time like yeah okay you really want to do something then let's commit to something let's commit to like a timeline to you know providing someone from your team to help us do this you know like if it matters to you then show me that it matters to you and kind of balancing that out Sus them. Susanna I'm gonna cut you off I'm sorry can we if you guys have more questions feel free to like jump outside and ask those questions to them they've been so great uh, but we have to move on to the next session. So I'm just going to cut you off right there. Thank you so much for your time, for the speakers, the moderators. <laughs>